Special relativity is full of so-called paradoxes, and some of them are pretty hard to explain on the spot, even if you are expert in the topic. And that is why for every modern physical theory we need a solid mathematical framework, so that we don't lose our minds trying to explain every possible physical scenario by the very postulates of the theory. That would be a seriously difficult way to do physics. Of course, every physical theory has its own limits, where it can no longer faithfully explain certain phenomena. This will usually manifest by having singularities, divergences or paradoxical predictions. Special relativity is of course not a theory of everything. It has also its own limits. It is a theory that tells you how certain quantities depend on which inertial observer measures them. So it is good for inertial observers, but interesting things start to happen if we include scenarios that are impossible using only inertial frames. Since two observers that are inertial can only ever meet once at the same location, but never twice. And this is the famous twin paradox, where at least one observer must change his direction to meet again. But before we start, we all need to agree on what is really paradoxical about this scenario. So imagine two observers A and B in two positions, the Earth and the star that are stationary relative to each other, and separated by distance of 10 light years measured in the rest frame of the observer A. The observer B jumps into a rocket and make a round trip towards the star and back where the two observers compare the elapsed time on their clocks. Now you want to calculate how much time have passed for each observer. You can do it in the rest frame of the observer A or the observer B. Or you can do it the smart way, where each observer only minds his own clock, and therefore you calculate the proper time for this trip for each observer. So let's do it. For the observer A, the observer B is moving with the velocity of 0.87 c and must cover the total distance of 20 light years and therefore by simple math it will take 23 years. And this is definite, there is no argument you can make against this result. The same thing you can do for the observer B. For him due to length contraction the distance is shorter by 2 and therefore in his frame the Earth must cover the total distance of 10 light years with a velocity of 0.87 c, which gives you by simple math 11.5 years. Now you compare these two results and you see that the observer B is younger. And this is again definite answer. Each observer only minds his own clock, so there is no time dilation involved. And whenever you are looking at a clock in your rest frame, they will always stick with the same rate. And this is how you calculate every twin paradoxical scenario. Just calculate the proper time for each observer and compare, and you can never do mistake. But this is not what the twin paradox is all about. If we live in a reasonable world, then it shouldn't matter which clock you are looking at. You should always get the same result. Otherwise, there is something odd about your theory. So let's take a look at the problem again from the frame of the observer A. And now we are looking also at the clock of the observer B. Here the total time for A will be 23 years as we already calculated, but due to time dilation the clock of the observer B is slower by 2 and therefore at the arrival the observer B will only have 11.5 years. And this is in accord with our previous discussion, so so far so good. But now, if we take a look at this problem from the reference frame of the observer B, it will take him 11.5 years of proper time. But now, the clock of the observer A is slower by 2, and therefore it should only read 5.75 years when they meet again. And this is what is paradoxical. It is not that you can't calculate the time differences. It is because the result is inconsistent in one particular scenario, and it is when the observer B watches the observer's A clock. In our example, 
both observers were inertial 100% of the trip, with the exception of this instant turnaround of the observer B. But if special relativity is correct, the observer B must have seen the observer A clock tick slower in both outgoing and ingoing part. This is also definite result. There is simply no way around it. If this is true, the only way it could play out is like this. They have the same clock at the start, and on the outgoing journey, the A clock must run slower by 2 until the observer B reaches the star. When he reaches the star, it must be 2.875 years on the A clock. Then something happens during the turnaround, and then on the ingoing journey, the observer B still have to see the A clock run slower by 2 adding another 2.875 years in such a way that the total clock of the observer A will read 23 years. So now we covered all the inertial part of the journey, so that it is all according to special relativity. But now we need to explain this mysterious 17 years gap that happened at this turnaround point. This is the only point where this gap could happen if we want the special theory of relativity make sense. Of course, the only thing you could do to change your direction in such a way is to accelerate. In real world, all of this would play out like this. The A clock would run slow on the outgoing journey. Then the observer B would start accelerating and the A clock would speed up rapidly. And again, on the ingoing journey, the A clock would be slow again. The crucial takeaway from all of this is the following. The spatially separated clocks will speed up if you accelerate. These have to be proportional to the amount of spatial separation and the rate of acceleration. In special relativity, this can be kind of explained by a rotation of your simultaneity plane in space-time diagram, which creates this gap in time. For example, a channel called Minute Physics has a nice video about it. Here is the time when most people start to argue about the relativity of acceleration. What gives us the right to claim that one observer was inertial the whole way and the other was not. I made a dedicated video about this topic. But simply, for every inertial observer, the momentum is always conserved. So, from the reference frame of the observer A, the momenta of the exhaust and the ship cancel out, leaving a zero total change in the momenta, whereas for the observer B, the A twin accelerates towards him without any reason. And moreover, the exhaust goes the same way, so the total momentum of the system changes drastically. So, only one observer has the right to claim that he was at the rest the whole way, and therefore the paradox is solved. You could also leave the observer B inertial, and therefore the observer A would have to accelerate to catch up the observer B, and in this case the observer A would be younger. You can easily do the math and it would add up perfectly, but despite all of this, it would be shame to leave this as an explanation. It feels like not the whole story was told, how can acceleration that is local change the rate of clocks that are far away? Maybe better answer can be found in a theory that is about special relativity. And one of such theories is general theory of relativity. This theory is firmly based on the so-called equivalence principle. In simple words, the equivalence principle states that Locally, you are not able to distinguish between artificially accelerated frame and a gravitational field. No experiment you can do to find out if you are in accelerating rocket or on the surface of a planet. Again, just locally, meaning that you are inside a box that is infinitesimally small with no windows. It is quite limiting, right? But the word locally is there only because gravitational field in the universe is always around a spherical body. And if you created a box with a finite size, there will be a tidal effect that will be measurable. 
since the gravitational field of a spherical body decreases with the second power of the distance from the center. So the word locally is there only for a practical purposes, but we are not going to work with a spherical gravitating bodies. We need the equivalence principle in its poorest form, so we can rewrite the statement like this. There is no measurable difference between accelerating rocket and a uniform gravitational field. Uniform gravitational field means that it is the same everywhere and it spans the entire universe. If you just wondered what would cause such a gravitational field, it would be an infinite deck. And if you stood on the deck, you would have no idea whether the deck is accelerating or it is just its gravitational field. You would experience the same physics in both of these cases. And now there is no word locally anymore. This principle holds globally and you don't need a small box with no windows anymore. Now I want to be clear. This principle doesn't tell you that you can't ever know whether you are in accelerating rocket or on an infinite deck. If you are in a rocket, you know you are in a rocket, right? Not to mention that there are no infinite decks in a universe. And also it would create the opposite field on the other side of the deck. This principle tells you that the experiences you have are the same. And therefore, when you accelerate in a ship, you are experiencing the same thing as if you stood on an infinite deck with a certain density and thickness. And therefore, you experience a uniform gravitational field that spans the entire universe. It is known from 1907 that light moving downwards in a gravitational field must gain energy. And the only way a light can gain energy is to increase its frequency. And therefore, if a certain oscillator creates this electromagnetic wave with a certain frequency on Earth, as the wave moves downwards in a gravitational field, the observer on the bottom of this field sees this oscillator oscillate much faster, and therefore time itself on Earth must tick much faster. Otherwise, we would have two inconsistent stories about how many oscillations were made in a certain time period. The equation that tells you how frequency of the light changes due to uniform gravitational field looks like this, where this is the original frequency of the source and this is the frequency on the bottom of the gravitational field. You can rearrange it slightly and this equation tells you by how much the frequency of the light increased compared to the original frequency. The frequency tells you the number of oscillations per unit of time. If you revert it, you get the time period per one oscillation. For the peace of mind, you can multiply it by the number of oscillations that happened during the acceleration, and you get a time interval on each clock. But the number of oscillations must be the same, so we can get rid of it. This is now elapsed time on the A clock for the observer B during the acceleration. And this is the elapsed time on the B clock for the observer B, so basically his proper time. So the elapsed time on A clock is much bigger than the elapsed time on B clock. This G here is a proper acceleration of the observer B. And now we can ask the question, how long did it take to accelerate? And it is simply the change of velocity divided by the proper acceleration. When we plug it in, we get this expression. And now we can make a consideration that the acceleration happened very fast compared to the duration of the trip. So that this term here is very small compared to this one. You can easily see this if you take the limit of g goes to infinity and you have the amount of time that passed on Earth due to the change of the frame of reference of the observer B. The total change in velocity is twice the 0.87c, and the rest length between these two points is 10 light years. So you will eventually get the missing 17.4 years. Now you can see a certain connection between relativity of simultaneity and equivalence principle. 
To me, the relativity of simultaneity feels like an integral of the equivalence principle, since it tells you the total time difference when you change the frame of reference, whereas equivalence principle tells you what is happening during the change. So the relativity of simultaneity is contained within the equivalence principle, which to me is very interesting. Equivalence principle can be sometimes hard to swallow by many people, because you might ask, how can a single observer turn on a uniform gravitational field throughout the entire universe? If the equivalence principle is correct, by turning on your rocket engine, the universe must behave the same way as if there was a uniform gravitational field everywhere. Wouldn't this destroy the universe as we know it? Well, no, because again, if the equivalence principle is correct, then every single thing in the universe is affected by gravity the same way. And since there is no physical difference between inertial frame and a free fall, then the situation is identical to having no field whatsoever. The only thing that is affected by this field is our observer in the rocket ship trying to preserve his place in the universe. And only for him the universe would be different. The funny things start to happen if we consider fields around the spherical bodies. Such a field cannot be transformed away as a uniform field could. And that is what makes them real. And the twin paradox becomes much more trickier because it's not always the case that the twin that feels acceleration is the younger one at the reunion. But this is a topic for another video. I think there will be forever arguments whether the twin paradox can be solved purely in the special relativity framework or you need something more like general relativity. But now you can at least make your own opinion on the matter. To me, since general relativity is about special relativity, the solution through equivalence principle feels much more fundamental than any special relativistic solution. But just for the record, I connected the equivalence principle to general relativity. But while the equivalence principle is necessary for general relativity to work, it is not a proof of general relativity. And it can serve as a base for other theories of gravity about the purely special relativistic explanations. There are many on the platform, for example this one from Dr. Lincoln. But to me this explanation is very unsatisfactory and I made a video about it. So check it out and I see you there.